This is Eric Topol, and I'm really thrilled. I've been so excited to have the chance to speak to Melanie Mitchell again. Melanie is a Davis professor of complexity, professor at the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico, and uh, I look to her as one of the real, not just leaders, but one with balance and thoughtfulness in this high-velocity AI world of large language models that we live in. And just by way of introduction, the way I got to first meet uh, Melanie was, uh, Professor Mitchell was through her book, Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. And it sure got me thinking uh, back, uh, I think, about four years ago. So welcome, Melanie. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. Yeah, there's so much to talk about. And you've been right in the middle of many of these things. So that's what makes it especially fun. I, I thought we'd start off a little bit of history because when we both were writing books uh, about AI back in 2019, publishing, um, the world kind of changed since <laughs> And in November, when ChatGPT got out there, it kind of signaled that there was this thing called transformer models. And I don't think many people really know the difference between a transformer model, which had been around for a while, but maybe it hadn't come to the surface, versus what were just the deep neural networks that ushered in deep learning that you had so systematically addressed in, in your book. Right. Yeah. Transformers are, were kind of a new thing. I can't remember exactly when they came out, maybe 2018, something like that. Right. From Google, um, they, they were an architecture that um, showed that you didn't really need to have a recurrent neural network in order to deal with language. So that, that was one of the earlier things, you know, and Google Translate and other language processing systems, people were using some recurrent neural networks, networks that sort of had um, feedback from one time step to the next. But now we have the transformers, which instead use what they call an attention mechanism, where the entire um, text that the system is dealing with is available all at once. And the name of the paper, in fact, was attention is all you need. <laughs> and that by attention is all you need, they meant this, this particular attention mechanism in the neural network. And that was really a revolution and enabled this new era of large language models. Yeah. And as you aptly pointed out, that was, in, that was five years ago that that attention is all you need. And then it took like oh, five years for it to become in the public domain of chat GPT. So what was going on in the background, you think? Well, you know, there, the, the, the idea of language models, that is uh, n neural network language models that um, learn by trying to predict the next word in a, in a text, um, had been around for a long time. You know, there, we, we have, you know, we now have GPT-4, which is what's underlying at least some of chat GPT, but there was GPT-1 and GPT-2, and you know you probably remember that. And all of this was going on over the, those many years. And um, I think that there, you know, those of us in the field have seen more of a progression with the um, uh, increase in abilities of these increasingly large, large language models uh, that has really been an evolution. But I think the general public didn't have access to them and right. ChatGPT was the first one that like was generally available, and that's why it sort of seemed to appear out of nothing. All right, so it was kind of the the inside world of the computer science kind of saw a more natural progression, but uh, people were not knowing that LLMs were on the move. They they kind of were stunned that oh look at these conversations I can have and how how humanoid it seemed. And yeah. uh, you'll recall there was a fairly um, a well-publicized event where a Google employee back, uh, I think, last fall uh, was, uh, I don't know, put on suspension, ultimately left Google because he felt that the uh, AI was sentient. Maybe you'd want to comment that because uh, that's kind of a precursor to some of the other things we're going to discuss. Right. So, um, yeah, so that one of the engineers who was working with um, their, their version of uh, uh, chat GPT, which I think at the time was called Lambda, um, was having conversations with it and came to the conclusion that it was sentient 
whatever that means, you know, <laughs> that, that it was aware that it had feelings that it, you know, experienced emotions and all of that. Um, and he, he was so, um, worried about this and he wanted, you know, I think he made it public by get, releasing some transcripts of his conversations with it. And I don't think he was allowed to do that under his Google contract. And that was the, the issue, <laughs> but yeah. And that made a lot of news and Google pushed back and said, no, no, of course it's not sentient. Uh, and then there was a lot of debate in the philosophy sphere of what sentience actually means, how you would know if something is sentient and it, yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of gone from there. Yeah. And then what was interesting is then the Microsoft research group published this Sparks paper where they said it seems like it has some uh, artificial general intelligence AGI qualities. And they're write, writing a research paper, which is kind of making the same claim to some extent, right? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, you know, intelligence is one thing, sentience is another. There's a question of whether, you know, how they're related right, is, or, or if they're related at all, you know, and what, what, it, what they all actually mean. And these terms, this is one of the problems, of course, these terms are not well defined, but most, I think most people in AI would say that intelligence and sentience are different, mm -hmm. that intelligence you know, something can be intelligent or act intelligently without having any sort of awareness or sense of self or, you know, feelings or whatever sentience might mean. So I think that the sparks of AGI paper from Microsoft was more about this, that saying that they thought GPT-4, the system they were experimenting with, showed some kind of generality in its ability to deal with different kinds of tasks. You know, and this, this contrasts with the, the um, old, older fashioned AI, which typically was narrow, only could do one task, you know, could play chess, could play Go, could do speech recognition, or could, you know, generate translations, but it, they couldn't do all of those things. <laughs> and now we have these language models, which seem to have some degree of generality. Now that gets us perfectly to a, um, a important nature uh, feature last week, uh, which was called the easy intelligence test that AI chatbots fail. And it made reference to an important um, study you did. First, I guess the term ARC, abstract and reasoning uh, corpus, I guess that was introduced a few years back by Francois um, Shallow, shallow, Chalet, shallow, yeah. Chalet, yes. And then you did a concept arc. So maybe you can tell us about this because that seemed to have a pretty substantial gap um, between humans and um, GPT-4. Right. So, so, so Francois Cholet is a researcher at Google who um, put together this set of sort of um, intelligence test like puzzles uh, visual reasoning puzzles that um, tested for abstraction abilities or analogy abilities. And um, he put it out there as a challenge. A whole bunch of people participated in a competition to get AI programs to solve the problems and none of them were very successful. And so um, what, what our group did was um, we thought that, that the original challenge was fantastic, but the pro one of the problems was it was too hard. <laughs> it was even hard for people. And also it didn't really systematically explore concepts, whether a, a system understood a particular concept. So as an example, think about, you know, the concept of s s uh, two things being the same or two things being different. Okay. So I can show you, you know, two things and say, are, are these the same or are they different? Well, it turns out that's actually a very subtle question because when we, you know, when we say the same, uh, we, we can mean um, sort of this, the same, uh, the same size, the same uh, shape, the same color, this, you know, and there's all kinds of attributes in which things can be the same. And um, 
So what our system did was it took concepts like same versus different and it tried to create lots of different challenges, puzzles that had that required understanding of that concept. So these are very basic spatial and semantic uh, concepts um, that were uh, similar to the ones that Cholet had proposed, but um, much more systematic. Because you know this is one of the big issues in evaluating AI systems is that people evaluate them on particular problems. Like you know, for example, you know I think a lot of people know that Chat GPT was able to answer many questions from the bar exam. But if you take like a single question from the bar exam and think about what concept it's testing, it may be that ChatGPT could answer that particular question, but it can't answer variations that mm -hmm. test the same concept. So we tried to take inside of this uh, ARC domain, abstraction and reasoning corpus domain, look at particular concepts and say, systematically, can the system understand different variations of the same concept? And then we tested this, these problems on humans. We tested them on the programs that were designed to solve the ARC challenges. And we tested them on GPT-4. And we found that humans way outperformed all the machines. But there's a caveat, though, is that these are visual puzzles. And we're giving them to GPT-4, which is a language model, a text right, right. system. Now, GPT-4 has been trained on images, but we're not using the system that can deal with images because that hasn't been released yet. So we're giving the system our problems in a text-based format rather than like, like giving it to humans who actually can see the pictures. So this this can make a difference. So I would say our, 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 our results are, are preliminary. Well, what do you think will happen when you can use in, inputs with images, do you think that it will equilibrate? There'll be parity or there still will be a gap in that particular measure of intelligence? I would predict that there will still be a big gap, mm -hmm. but you know, I guess we'll see. <laughs> well, that, that's what we want to get into more. We want to drill down on the biggest question of large language models. Uh, and that is, are they really, uh, you know, what is their level of intelligence? Is it something that is, beyond the so-called stochastic parrot or the statistical ability to adjudicate language words. So there was a paper this week um, in Nature Human Behavior, not one that normally publishes these, these kind of papers. And as you know, uh, it was by Taylor Webb and colleagues at UCLA. And it was basically saying for analogic reasoning, uh, making analogs, which would be more of a language task, I, I guess, but also some image uh, capabilities that it could do as well or better than humans. And these were college students, so <laughs> just to qualify, they're they're not, um, you know, maybe not, they're not fully representative of the species, but they're at least uh, some learned folks. So, what did what did you think of that study? Yeah, I found it really fascinating um, and, and kind of provocative. And, you know, it, it kind of goes along with a, a many, there's been many studies that have, have been applying uh, tests that were kind of designed for humans, psychological tests to large language models. And this one was applying sort of analogy tests that, that psychologists had done on humans to, 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 to large language models. But there's always kind of an issue of interpreting the results because we know these large language models most likely do not think like we do. Mm. And so one question is like, how are they performing these analogies? How are they making these analogies? So there, there's, when you're evaluating, so this brings up some issues with evaluation when we try to evaluate large language models using tests that were designed for humans. One question is, were these tests at all actually in the training data of the large language model? Like had they, you know, these language models are trained on enormous amounts of text that humans have produced. And some of the tests that that paper was using were things that had been published in the psychology literature. Mm. So one question is, you know, to what extent were those in this training data? It's hard to tell because we don't know what the training data exactly is. 
So that's one question. Another question is, uh, are these systems actually using analogical reasoning the way that we humans use it? Or are they using some other way of solving the problems? Mm. And that's also hard to tell because these systems are black boxes. But it might actually matter because it might affect how well they're able to generalize. You know, if I can make an analogy, um, usually you would assume that I could actually use that analogy to understand some new, you know, some new situation uh, by an analogy to some old situation. But it's not totally clear that these systems are able to do that in any general way. And so, you know, I think this, these, these, these results, like these analogy results are really provocative and interesting, but they, they, they will require a lot of further study to really make sense of what they mean. Like to yeah. say, just like, you know, when, when you give, when, when the, the, you know, chat GPT passes a bar exam, you might ask, well, and let's say it's, you know, it does better than most humans. Can you say, well, can it now be a lawyer? Can it go out and replace human lawyers? <laughs> I mean, a human who passed the bar exam can do that. But I don't know if you can make the same assumption for a language model because it's the way that it's doing, answering the questions and the way that it's reasoning might be quite different and not imply the same kinds of more general abilities. Yeah, that's really vital. And something else that you just brought up uh, in multiple dimensions is the problem of transparency. So we don't even know the, the specs, the actual training, you know, so many of the components that led to the model. Uh, and so you, by not knowing this, uh, we're kind of stuck to try to interpret it. And I, I guess if you could comment about transparency seems to be a really big issue. And then how are we going to ever understand when there's certain uh, aspects or components of intelligence where, you know, there does appear to be something that's surprising, something that you wouldn't have anticipated. And how, how could that be? Or on the other hand, you know, why is it failing? Um, uh, so what is, is transparency the key to this or is there something more to be unraveled? I think transparency is, is a big part of it. Transparency, meaning, you know, knowing what the what data the system was trained on sort of what what the architecture of the system is um you know what was other aspects that go into designing the system those are important for us to understand like how how these systems are actually work and to assess them but people you know there are some methods that people are using to try and um kind of tease out the extent to which these systems have actually developed sort of the kind of intelligence that people have. So, so one, there was a paper that came out also last week, I think, um, from a group at MIT, where they looked at several tasks that were given that GPT-4 did very well on. It seemed like pro, uh, certain uh, computer programming, code generation, mathematics, um, s some other tasks. And they said, well, if a human was able to, to generate these kinds of um, things, to do these kinds of tasks, some small change in the task w probably shouldn't matter. The human would still be able to do it. So as an example, in, in programming, you know, generating code, you know, so there's this notion that like an array is indexed from zero. The first number is, is indexed as zero. The second number is indexed as one and so on. So, um, but some programming languages start at one instead of zero. So what if you just said, now change to starting at one, probably a human programmer could adapt to that very quickly, but they found that GPT-4 was not able to adapt. Mm -hmm. very well. mm -hmm. So the question was, is it using being able to write the program by sort of picking things that it has already seen in its training data much more, or is it able to, or is it actually developing some kind of human-like understanding of the program? 
And they were finding that to some extent, it was more the former than the latter. So when you th- process all this, are, do you lean more towards because of the pre-training and the stochastic parrot side, or do you uh, <laughs> think there is this enhanced human understanding that we're seeing a level of machine intelligence, not broad intelligence, but at least some parts of con- what we would consider intelligence that we've never seen before? W- where do you find yourself? Yeah, I think I'm 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 sort of in the center. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> everybody that's everybody good. loves to describe themselves as a centrist, right? Um, <laughs> No, I, I don't think these systems are, you know, stochastic parrots. They're, they're not just sort of parroting the data that they, they've been trained on. Although they do do that sometimes, you know. But I do think there is some reasoning ability there. Mm-hmm. There is some, you know, what you might call intelligence. You know, it's, it's but the, the question is, how do you characterize it? And and. How, How do you, the most important thing is, you know, how do you decide that it, that these systems have a general enough understanding to trust them? Right, right. You know, know, in your field in, in medicine, I think that's a super important question. They can, maybe they can outperform radiologists on some kind of diagnostic task. But the question is, you know, is that because they understand the um, data like radiologists do or even better and will therefore in the future be much more trustworthy or are they doing something completely different that means that they're going to make some very un- unhuman like mistakes yeah. and I think we just don't know well that's that's an important uh admission if you will that is we don't know and as you're again uh i think really uh, zooming in on, on for medical applications, um, some of them, of course, are not so critical for accuracy because you, for example, if you have a, a conversation in a, in a clinic and that's made into a node and all the other downstream tasks, you still can go right to the transcript and see exactly if there was a potential miscue. But if you're talking about making a diagnosis in a, you know, in a complex uh, patient, uh, that can be if if you if we see hallucination confabulation or whatever your favorite word is to characterize the false uh, outputs that that's a big issue. But I I actually really love your professor of complexity because if there's anything complex this this would f- fulfill it. And also, would you say it's time to stop talking about the Turing test that retire it, it's it's over with the Turing test because it's so much more complex than that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one problem with the Turing test is there never was a Turing test. Turing never really gave the details of how this this test should work, right? And so we've had Turing tests with chatbots, you know, since the 2000s where people have been fooled. It's not that hard to fool people into thinking that they're talking to a human. So I I do think that the Turing test is not adequate for the the question of like are these things thinking are they robustly intelligent yeah one of my favorite stories you told in your book was about hans clever um and the uh you know basically faking out the potential that that there was this machine intelligence with that and yeah i I think uh this this is uh so apropos a term that is used a lot that a lot of people i don't think fully understand is zero shot or one shot, or can you just uh, help explain that to the non-computer science community? Yeah, so so um, in the context of large language models, what that means is, um, so I could, so do I give you, zero, zero shot means I just ask you a question and expect you to answer it. One shot means I give you an example of a question and an answer, and now I ask you a new question that, you, you should answer, but you already had an example. You know, two shot is you give two examples. So it's just a ma- matter of like, how many examples am I going to give you in order for you to get the idea of what I'm asking? Yeah. Well, and in a sense, if you were pre trained uh, unknowingly, it might not be zero shot. 
that is, if, if, the, if the model was pre-trained with all the stuff that was really loaded into that first question or prompt, it might not really qualify as a zero shot in a way, right? Yeah, right. If it's already uh, seen that, if it's learned, if getting... it's seen that in its training data. Right, right, exactly. Now, another topic that is related to all this is that you uh, participated in what I would say is a historic debate. Uh, you and Jan LeCun, who I would not have necessarily put together. Uh, I don't know that Jan is a centrist. I would say he's more, you know, on one end of the spectrum versus um, 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 yeah, Max Tegmark, Tegmark and, yeah. and Yoshua. Yoshua, Yoshua Bengio. Yeah, Yoshua yeah. Bengio, who was one of the three uh, notables uh, for a uh, Turing Award uh, with Jeffrey Hinton and Jan. So yeah. you were in this debate, debate uh, it was the Musk, I think, Musk debate. No, monk, not, monk debate. Monk, no, monk, <laughs> I was going to say not Musk, right, <laughs> monk debate. Yeah, uh, the Monk debates, which is a classic debate series out of, I think, University of Toronto. Or, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. And um, it was debating, you know, is it all over? Is AI going to... And obviously, there's been a lot of this in recent weeks, months, since ChatGPT surfaced. So... Can you kind of give it, I, I tried to access that debate, but since I'm not a member or a subscriber, I couldn't watch it. And I'd love to actually, uh, but can you give us the skinny of what was discussed and your position there? Sure. Yeah. So, so actually you can't, you can access it on YouTube. Oh, you know, good. Free. Okay. Yeah, good. Free. I'll put so, the link in for this. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so, so the, the resolution was, you know, is AI an existential threat? Okay, but an existential meaning human extinction. <laughs> so pretty dramatic, right? Uh, and um, there's been th this debate actually has been going on for a long time, you know, since since the the, the beginning of the talk talks about this the quote unquote singularity, right? Uh, and um, there's many people in the sort of AI world who fear that AI, once it becomes quote unquote smarter than people, will be, uh, will lose control of it. We'll, we'll give it some task like, you know, solve, solve the problem of carbon emissions. And it will then misinterpret or this uh, sort of not not care about the consequences. It, uh, uh, it will just sort of maniacally try and achieve that goal, and in, in the process of that, for accidentally kill us all. So that's one of the scenarios. There's many different scenarios for this, you know. And the you know debate. The debate was it was very um, a debate is kind of an artificial, weird, structured discussion uh, where you have rebuttals and try, you know, but um, I think the debate really was about sort of, sh should we right now be focusing our attention on what's called existential risk? That is that, you know, some future AI is going to become smarter than humans and then somehow destroy us, or should we be more focused on more immediate risks? The ones that we have right now of, um, like AI creating disinformation, uh, fooling people in, in, into thinking it's a human, magnifying biases in society, all the risks that people, you know, are experiencing immediately, right? You know, or will be very soon. Uh, and that the debate was more about sort of what should be the focus of our mm, attention. Mm, mm. And whether we can focus on very shorter, shorter, immediate risks, also, and also focus on very long-term speculative risks, and sort of what is the likelihood of those speculative risks, and how would we, you know, even uh, estimate that? So that was kind of the the, the topic of the debate. So did, did you all wind up agreeing then? That <laughs> no. You scared, or, or where where did it land? Well, I don't know. I you know it. 
the the uh, interestingly what they do is they take a vote at the beginning of the mm, audience mm, mm. and um they say like you know how many people agree with with the resolution and 67 percent of people agreed that ai was an existential threat so it was two-thirds and then at the end they also take a vote and say like how many what percent of minds were changed and that's the side that wins but uh, ironically, the the voting mechanism broke at the end. <laughs> so technology, you know, for the win. <laughs> so there wasn't a post debate vote. So they did do an email survey, oh, oh. which is, I think, not very, you know, no, not very. No, you good. can't compare that. Yeah. No. So I, you know, technically our side won. Okay. But. I don't take it as a win, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess another way to put it: Are you are you afraid? Are you scared? So I I'm not scared of like super intelligent AI getting out of control and um, destroying humanity. Right. I think there's a lot of reasons why that's extremely unlikely. Right. But I am, I do fear a lot of things about AI. You know, some of the things I mentioned. Yes. I think are real threats, you know, real dire threats to democracy. Absolutely. That, to our information ecosystem, how much we can trust the information that we have. And um, also just, you know, to people, you know, losing jobs to AI. I've already seen that happening. Right. And the sort of disruption to our whole economic system. So I am worried about those. Yeah. Things. Yeah. No, I think the inability to determine whether something's true or fake uh, in so many different spheres is putting us in a lot of jeopardy, highly vulnerable, um, but perhaps not the broad existential threat of the species. Yeah. Um, but serious stuff for sure. Uh, now, another thing that's just been of interest of late is the willingness for at least one of these companies, uh, Meta, to put out their model um, as an open, I'm a two, uh, I guess, uh, to, to make it open for everyone so that they can do whatever specialized fine tuning and whatnot. Is that a good thing? Is that is that um, a, is that a game changer for the field? Because obviously the computer resources, which we understand, for example, GPU uh, used over twenty five thousand uh, G- for GPT four or twenty five thousand GPUs, and not not many groups or entities have that many GPUs on hand to ba- to do the base models. But is having an open model like uh, Meta's available? Uh, is that good or is that potentially going to uh, be a problem? Yeah, I think um, probably I would say yes to both. <laughs> okay. okay. You no, know, because because it is a, it is a mixed bag. I, I think ultimately, you know, we talked about transparency and open source models are transparent. I mean, I, I don't know if I don't think they actually have released information on the data they use to train right. it. Right. So that it lacks that transparency, but at least you know if you are doing research and um, trying to uh, understand how this model works, you have access to a lot of the model. You know, it would be nice to know more about the data it was trained on. But um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of big positives there, uh, and it also means that you know your the data that you then use to continue training it or fine tuning it is not then being given to a big company. Like you're not doing it through some closed API like you do for open AI. Uh, on the other hand, you know, these, as, as we just saw, talked about, these models can be used for a lot of uh, negative things like, you know, spreading disinformation and so on. Right. And um, giving, sort of making them generally available and tunable by anyone presents that risk. Yeah. So I think there's, you know, there's an analogy, I think, you know, with like genetics, for example, you know, or, or, or disease, disease uh, research, where I think there was a, uh, the, the, the scientists had, had, had uh, sequenced the genome of the smallpox virus, right? And there was like a big debate over should they publish that? Mm-hmm. 
because it could be used to like create a new smallpox. Right. But right. on the other hand, it also could be used to 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 develop uh, better vaccines and better treatments and so on. And so I think there there are you know any technology like that, there's always the sort of balance between transparency and making it open and um, keeping it closed. And then the question is who gets to control it? Yeah, who gets to control it and to understand the potential for nefarious uh, use cases, uh, the worst yeah. case scenario, sure. Uh, well, you know, I look to you, uh, Melanie, as a leading light because you are so balanced and, you know, you don't, the centrist thing about you is what I have the highest level of respect. And that's why I like to read anything you write or where you're making comments about other people's work. Are you going to write another book? <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about it now. I mean, I think kind of a follow up to my book, which, as you mentioned, like your book, it was uh, before uh, large language models came on the scene and before Transformers and all of that stuff. And I think that there really is a need for some non-technical explanation of all of this. But of course, you know, every time you write a book about AI, it becomes uh, obsolete by the time it's published. <laughs> that, that's what I worry about, you know, and that was actually going to be my last question to you, which is, you know, where are we headed, like, whatever, GPT-5 and on, uh, and it's, going, it's the velocity so high, uh, it, where can you get a steady state to write about and try to, you know, pull it all together? Or, or are we just going to be in some crazed, uh, zone here for some time where the things are moving too fast to try to be able to get your arms around it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I think there's a question of like, are, can, can, can AI keep moving so fast? You know, we've obviously it's moved extremely fast in the last few years. And, but the way that it's moved fast is by uh, having huge amounts of training data and scaling up these models. But the problem now is it's almost like the field has run out of training data <laughs> generated by people. And if, if it go, you know, if people start using language models all the time for generating text, the internet is going to be full of generated text, right, human right. written text. And it's been shown that if these models keep are sort of trained on the text that they generate themselves, they start behaving very poorly. Mm. So that's a question is like, where's the new data going to come from? And there's <laughs> lots of upsetness among people whose data are being used. Oh, sure. Uh, understandably. And as you uh, get to, uh, is there a limit of, you know, there's only so many Wikipedias and internets and hundreds of thousands of books and whatnot to put in that are of human source content. So do we reach a plateau of human derived um, um, input? That's a really fascinating question. I, perhaps things will not continue at such a, a crazed pace. So we can, um, I mean, the way you put together a guide for thinking humans was so prototypic because it, it was so thoughtful and it brought along those of us who were not trained in computer science to really understand where the state of the field was and where deep neural networks were. We need another one of those. And you're no one, I nominate you to, to help us to give us the, the, the right uh, perspective. So um, Melanie, Professor Mitchell, I'm so grateful to you. All of us uh, who follow your work um, remain indebted for kind of keeping it straight. You know, you, you, you don't get ever get carried away. Um, and uh, we learn from that, all of us. It's really important because this, you know, there's so many people on one end of the spectrum here, whether it's doomsday or whether this is just stochastic paired or open source and whatnot. It's really good to have you as a reference anchor to help us uh, along. Well, thanks so much, Eric. That's really kind of you.